Hey everybody, sorry. Oh, wait a minute. I did not create the next section. Wait a minute. I could have sworn. This is really weird. Hello there, uh, Simon here. Hello. Uh, you know what I did? I modified, hold on. <laughs> I put today's after last week's. So hold on a minute. I apologize. I'm just coming off another meeting that I was presenting at. That's why I didn't get a chance to do this beforehand. Hold on. All right. That was Simon. What is your last name again? I apologize. Uh, Simon Heimler from SAP. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to admit that. Do me a favor. <laughs> Can you edit that um, for me when you get a chance? If not, I'll figure it out later. Uh, I'll write it in the chat. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Tommy, are you there? Yo. Yo. Daniel? Hello. Hello. Uh, Ginger? Good morning, afternoon, whatever time. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Good whatever. Yes, I like that. <laughs> All right. Hey, Jim. Hey. All right. And Manuel? Hi. Hello. Uh, Scott? Okay. Hello. Timur? Hey. Hello. Hello. Uh, Christoph? Hi. Hello. And uh, who was it? Lance said he wasn't going to make it. Oh, boy. Hello, Clemens. Hello. Sorry for being three minutes late or so. You're good. Uh, thank you, Simon. All right. We have a, I, I really struggled to find uh, topics for today's call. Um, in fact, we have no PRs to review. Um, wasn't sure which issues to discuss, so I'm looking for you guys to help fill it out, or we can end really early, one of the two. Uh, uh, I like free time. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> I'm so hungry. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, all right. I see I need to go and create more work. Yes, I think we all need to create more work for us. Um, Matthew, are you there? Matthew? Matt, Matt, Matthew? What about Klaus? Yeah, hi, Doc. Hello. Oh, Klaus. So, Clemens or Klaus, picking on oh. you for being German here, how would you pronounce his name? Matthew. Matthew. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Which yeah, Matthew, Matthew oh, are you there? Okay. <laughs> is it say that again, Clemens? Which is French, but okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, oh. He, Doug, he says he doesn't have sound. Oh, here, thank you. I didn't even look at the chat. Thank you. There we go. Okay, we got him. All right, it's three after. Did I get everybody? Oh, Slinky, are you there? Yep. All right, let's go then. See how quickly we can end this thing. Uh, just a reminder, if you have an AI, um, please look at it when you get a chance. Anything from the community that people want to bring up? No. Okay. Cool. Uh, we do have an SDK call this week. I last time I checked, there wasn't anything on the agenda. Let's just quickly check. Yeah, we have nothing there. Uh, so if you want to do something, um, go ahead and add another section for today's agenda. Otherwise, we may not have a call. Um, where was I going next? Oh yeah, okay, discovery interrupt. Uh, next week's call. I don't think there's anything been updated in the discovery doc. So please, if you are planning on doing something there, help fill this out. Um, it's on my to-do list as well. Um, I think the more important thing at this point in time is for everybody to actually start coding more than anything else. Um, I, the way I kind of look at it is, uh, once you get the base infrastructure in place, the rest of it should be easy, hopefully. But please start coding that way you can find errors in the spec and try to get those ironed out before the proposed interop on November 2nd, which is only a couple weeks away. All right. And Tim, or anything from the workflow side of things you want to mention? Um, yeah, we, from the specification side, we had an agreement and we added um, uh, the use of open API for service invocation definitions. We also, um, create a couple of um, training type of videos that uh, mostly for the community, but also we will use them for KubeCon. 
And just overall, Cubecom this year, we have a project booth and that doing that, this intro, intrado, is that what it's called? Thing is just, uh, it's, it's a pain. So putting a lot of hours into that. Um, so that's it. Okay, any questions about the workflow stuff? Okay, just to let you guys know, um, since he mentioned it, <clears throat> we did not sign up for a booth. Um, however, I did sign us up for, I think it's called office hours. Um, I have, unless I missed it, I have not seen the sign up sheet for when the office hours might be. Uh, when I get that, I'll look for some message on the Slack channel, because I suspect uh, we probably, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I can forward it to you that email. Oh, did I miss it? <laughs> yeah, you should have gotten it. <clears throat> you know, I actually had a problem with this. I haven't said anything to CNCF, but last time we had to express interest. And then once the deadline was over, then they opened the calendar. It seems like this time, as soon as you responded, they opened the calendar to you. So there are a lot of times that were gone already by the time. Oh, wow. So I responded on Monday. And a lot of Wednesday was completely gone already. Hmm. Okay. So well, when you guys confirm me, yeah, if you confirm me the email, obviously I missed it. I've been getting so many emails from them. I just, I, I'm starting to phase it out. Um, so, <laughs> so, so if you can send me the email, I'll, I'll look for some times and maybe just grab one. And if it doesn't work, we can always adjust. But um, I don't anticipate it being difficult. Uh, last time we had very few people show up. Uh, so we just need somebody to, you know, warm bodies in there is probably all we need. I think most questions should be easy. So, all right. All right. With that, let's keep moving forward. As I said, I couldn't, we have no PRs to look at. Uh, issues, I picked out just a couple I thought might be interesting. Let's pick on this one first since that one got a little bit of traction over the last couple of days. So just to refresh everybody's memory, this one is really about, um, the spec says basically, uh, if a property exists, it has to have a value. Leave out, leave out extensions for a minute because there's a hole there. But for all the spec properties, you can assume that if the property exists, there will be a value there. It will not be null. At least that's what the spec kind of leans towards. But this issue is really about, is that really what we want? Um, and so let me pick on Jim and Klaus, since you guys commented the most recently on this, to get your opinion on what we might do with the situation, if anything. So, Jim, you want to go first and give your opinion on this? Uh, not really, but I will, I guess. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, I, when, as I read the spec, it doesn't, it doesn't, to me, read like we support nulls. Uh, and I wouldn't expect to receive an attribute with no value. I, I think my bigger concern is if you do, um, how do you, are we meant to propagate that through all the different transports yeah so if we were you know going to send a null attribute over http what would we put in the header for that you know um, does it then make everything more complex you know because it might expect the word null in a, in a header attribute that was only expected to be i don't know a number um, so i think it, it sort of is a bit of a deeper issue than than it might appear um, but i would lean to not allowing or or explicitly saying that if if an attribute is defined it should have a value okay uh klaus did you want to chime in here since you commented yeah so basically i, I agree to what, what Chem said uh, so i just would like to emphasize that it's not about the empty value it's about the null value of the discussion so uh, I, I realized that most of the standard context attributes also um, state that they shouldn't be an empty value, but that's, I think, a different topic. So, um, and I agree that, that transporting null uh, explicitly would be then a challenge for each and every uh, protocol binding and, and format. So that's also what I wrote here. Um, I propose that we treat null as the same as not present. But I guess we would then have to make that more clear in the type system and then in some of the formats, like for JSON, where you can then distinguish null and not present, but I mean, undefined and null, that this would mean the same for us. Okay, so just before I get to you, I just want to 
ask a clarifying question because Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to indicate you wanted the spec to be more clear to say we do not support null. But Klaus, you start off saying you agree with Jim, but then you ended with we should allow both, but be clear that null is the same thing as not present. Well, I, I say that either we allow it and treat it as the same or we don't allow it at all and um, yeah. Okay, got it. It's okay. pretty much the same. It's just the subtlety of what would be easier for the, the um, SDKs and, and for handling of JSON in detail. And here yeah, would also rely on, on feedback from the SDK implementers. Okay, okay, thank mm -hmm. you for the clarification. Okay, Clemens, your hand is up. Uh, I would like to, to uh, support what Klaus just said, um, which, or what he writes there, because I, um, uh, null values, I don't think we, we allow them anywhere, but if null appears, then that's um, some, especially for JSON, some serializers ser serialize out null if the um, object is not present and if you have a um, a strongly typed structure, uh, which you might have for a, for, for a cloud event, then um, you, know, you fill all the values that you want to go and fill in and you omit the ones that you uh, don't want to set and those that end up being null right, in Java or in C Sharp or other languages. And if you happen to, have, happen to use a serializer that wants to go and serialize out those values with null values really uh, on the wire, then, then that's what it is, right? So, so I, I, that's so. Uh, I think that means then that the there is no value because nobody said it. Okay, thank you, uh, Scott. Your hands up next. What do folks think about uh, trying to limit this to just the JSON binding? Because I, I think trying to figure out what this means for the HTTP structured encoding is kind of weird. That's fine with me. I mean, this is something that I, I, I think this makes sense to define in the, in the uh, encodings. I was going to say, does that mean, are, you, are you implying, Scott, that this isn't a core spec change, but rather a transport change? Yeah, it's a it's a change to the HTTP binding for only structured events. It's it's a J, it's a JSON format change. I would even argue. Oh yes, sorry. It's it's for JSON only. Yeah, because which applies if the value to is absolute, structured. Yeah, if the value is not set, then we would not map a header. But there's no expectation that the that the shape of that is lossy or sorry lossless if it goes from say HTTP structured to binary to structured again, you yeah. don't, you lose that information that there was a nil. Yeah, because the field wasn't there in the beginning. So but it's the, the case I just want to want to make not too complicated for, for the, um, for the innocent is if, I mean, literally, if you code up a POCO type, Right, and you grab just grab a grab a serializer, and the serializer is the its default is to not emit the values, but to to write them out onto onto the wire as null. Then um, then that's what you should that's that's the situation you're in, and I'm so I'm not sure we should make it really difficult for those folks who want to go and express a cloud event as a strongly poco, a strongly typed POCO type in their, in their app. Um, it should not be hard for them to write compliant um, uh, cloud events either way. Yeah, this, this seems like IoT might care about this. I am currently um, having a, a side job um, helping a soccer, professional soccer club, their IT stuff. And then, so I'm dealing, dealing with developers who are just doing dynamics every day. And that is um, calibrating my uh, perspective, I would say, for how complicated it can be to deal with JSON. So I'm, 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 I'm a little um, um, disillusioned, I would say. <laughs> okay. Well, Jim, I know your hand's up, but I think mine was up first. Let me just ask my question. It's kind of what I tried to say here in my chat. I, I'm wondering, while I understand from a straight 
geeking spec perspective, it probably would be good to add some clarifying text here. And I think Scott, your suggestion of trying to limit this to just the, the JSON stuff probably makes sense. And just a heads up, I will be looking for a volunteer in a sec. But the reason I raised my hand was I'd, I'd like to better understand why this matters at all in the sense that as the receiver of this, what would someone do differently, whether it's present in the CE or not present in the CE? With, I mean, sorry, present in the CE with a null versus not present at all. What would the what would the receiver do differently between those two cases? Well, the GoLang one would not blow up. Is the change? Because right now, if you send a a nil value, no quote is just nil onto a string, it doesn't know how to decode that. That's custom. Wait, uh, back up a little. I'm, I'm confused. What, if you talk about a, an optional property, the Java would the, the GoLang Java. I'm sorry. The, yeah, the GoLang JSON parser will blow up with a with a null. Yep, it doesn't. It doesn't work. You can't uh, turn a, a struct that has a string, and you say inside the JSON version that I'm marshalling into the struct. It, uh, it doesn't know how to turn a, the value null into a string. It just blows up. Okay, so you need this on the Golang side because you need to know whether you need to add specialized logic or treat this as an error condition or reject the, the cloud event, right? That's right. And so because of this, some of the test grid pieces don't work with the Golang SDK. Interesting. Okay, that helps. Thank you, Scott. Okay, Jim, I think your hand is up next. Uh, so for me, I guess it's, you know, what's the expected behavior of, a, of an SDK? I mean, if, a, if an SDK receives a JSON format with a nil, um, and I say to it, is this attribute present? Is it going to say yes, or is it going to say no? I, I'm going to get a different answer if that was subsequently, I don't know, marshaled, you know, as a binary through... Um, HTTP because that header wouldn't be there. So it, it just, I think it's just going to lead to, in, you, you're going to have to provide guidance to SDK writers as to how they're expected to handle this situation to get a consistent application um, uh, semantic of, of sort of dealing with stuff. Okay, Scott, your hands up. I hope hopefully to answer that. Yeah, so I, I think from my side, Integrators never are asking questions about the original payload. They're asking questions about the the converted nominal form of the event. And so in that case, I think it ends up being the same. If if something was set to nil, the parser understands that that should just ignore it and not set that value. So I think you end up with the result, the resulting exact same object after uh, marshalling. All right. Uh, Slinky, your hands up. Yeah, I'm just thinking that in the case of uh, the SDKs I'm working on, so both SDK Rust and SDK Java, uh, this requires changing the main APIs because then we because now the assumption is only there is something, there isn't anything, and if anything is null or not present, uh, it doesn't make any difference for the interface itself. So this this will require changing the stuff. Okay, Klaus, I think your hand was up next. Uh, oh wait, I'm sorry, were you yeah. done, Slinky? No, 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 if, if I can add something, to be honest, yeah. I, I'm not even sure how, should I, for example, model this in Rust? Like, I'm saying I'm saying one language, but I have, I have, no, real, I have no real idea how should I model this in Rust. I mean, uh, what happens when it's not present and, and what should I say when it's not present? What should I say when it's not? So the language doesn't give me the ability to, to model the null, in fact. It just gives okay. me the ability to, to, or to say there's something or there isn't anything. So I think Clemens' point is that the, the marshaller sees no difference between something that was not present and something that was null. Right. Yeah, that's, that's right. If you, so... In the case of in the marshaller and also someone who's looking at at a, at a strongly typed object in in Java or in C sharp or any 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 type language, uh, they see no difference between whether you sent null 
or, or, or a meant to set null or whether the object is absent. It's, it's semantically identical. Okay, I'm not sure who, um, I guess, Slinky, that, those answers were directed towards you. Does that help? Or do you need more clarification? No, no, I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm just saying that uh, I, I think it, we, we shouldn't have this difference at the API level, if I understood correctly the, what's the discussion, where the discussion is going. Okay. Uh, Klaus, I think your hand was up next. Yeah, so a, a remark. Um, if it's just about the JSON format or also the main spec, I think the main spec has this uh, CE type system and also mentions that there are canonical uh, string representations. So maybe some clarification there that there is no representation of null in, the, in that type system could also help. Okay. Um, Simon, I think your hand was up next. Yeah, thanks. So I just wanted to point out one use case where null is actually different than being undefined or and that's, for example, if you send patch requests or use the JSON merge patch um, semantics and there a null basically says, if you know this property uh, and you have a value for that, you need to remove it. So it's yeah, in that case, yeah. But we don't have that use case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it might be a different MIME type anyway, yeah. This is only for the, the envelope properties. Uh, not the body. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. you, you could still do that same patch semantics inside the body, the payload. Okay, sorry, then I missed this. Yeah, you're right. Okay. I can't remember why I raised my hand, so I'll lower it. <laughs> um, for everybody's hand that up, did, did, you already, did you guys already talk or did, was there something else? You, I just wanted to know those hands are old, basically. Okay, I'm gonna assume they're old. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing is add language to the JSON only spec. Well, I, actually, okay, two things. Add language to the JSON spec to make it clear that null and absent are the same. Klaus, you were thinking that we may need to add something to the main specs type system section. Um, but I think those are the scope of the possible changes we've talked about so far. What do people think about those two possible changes? In particular, I wanted to pick on Jim to get your reaction. Repeat what I'm having a reaction to. <laughs> what, would, would you be okay with us changing the JSON spec to make it clear that absent is the same as null? So would somebody then change the JSON schema definition we have to reflect that? I, I'm not sure if that would be needed as well. I don't know. Let's see what the JSON schema looks like. Um, let's find one that's empty or right here. So at the bottom, you need to go down oh, to the, the actual okay. definitions. So I, can't see data def is the only thing that we currently have defined that is allowed technically to be null. All the other um, attributes don't allow null as it's currently schemed if people are using this and schema genning, code genning off it. So would it be horribly incorrect for us to say that this was just an oversight and this is more like a typo change by, because we need to add null to all these up here? I, I think it's, yeah, I mean, that's what it would be. It's just an omission. Um, but would, would you be okay with that direction? Because you, you had, well, you had it, concerns. It, well, I mean, it's just, it, if we want to allow stuff to be null, then we should define that it's allowed to be null. I, I guess that's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Uh, Simon, your hands up. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm just getting into this, but, um, I don't see. So if we say null providing null or, 
is the same as not providing it the same, then we could just um, disallow null at all and we would get the same behavior and don't have to change uh, our contract basically. It's just adding that uh, it's already defined in the JSON schema that null is not allowed. So basically it's just not worded out. Okay, Scott, I think you raise your hand for this. Yeah, the, I think the issue that we've run into is that if you if you write a database that's cloud events enabled, uh, the database has no ability to uh, omit n null values. It'll send them out as the attribute. Correct. Okay. This this is intended for um, dumb producers and smart consumers, I think. Okay, so if the producer is dumb as and there's no mapping being done, it's directly exposed. Yeah, it just direct serial serializes the struct that it has, and if it sees no value, it, it literally writes the null value. Mm, okay, thanks for the context. Okay, I remember now when I, when I raised my hand, and I think it was because of what Jim said earlier, is there's no way to, for a consumer then to distinguish between not present and present with null. And it, it gave me flashbacks to, um, to looking at query parameters in Golang, right? Because you can use the methods, um, on the, I think it's the query object, to actually just you know, say, give me the value. And there's no way to distinguish between empty string versus the, the, uh, the property wasn't there at all. You know, property not there at all is always going to return empty string. If you want to actually find out where the query parameter is there, but with no value, you have to actually go look at the, 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 uh, the map itself to do that. And it just got me wondering, and I know, Scott, you said that most people don't never really need to look at the original cloud event itself. They're looking at more what the semantic meaning is later on down the line. I, I wanted to poke on that a little, not to say that I think it's wrong, but more to make sure we've thought about this because I am worried about somebody coming along and saying, you know what, I, my, my SDK does not shield the user from anything. They basically show them what it was basically on the wire for the most part. And I wanna make sure that we're not gonna close off use cases where someone says, you know what, I really do need to know whether the, whether the thing was present with null versus not present at all for some reason. I just, I just wanna make sure we're not missing some use case here. Can anybody think of any reason why someone actually might give a crap as to whether the property was there with null versus not at all? And given that the guidance is that these attributes are meant for uh, routing and uh, maybe tagging of some sort of event, and it's not the payload itself, it's a, I think you're probably doing it wrong if you, you're expecting the existence of some nil value, especially because the spec says it must be uh, min length one. We're doing a special case here for serialization between wire format and conical form. Okay, I'm okay with that answer. Which, I, just, I just get nervous, but okay. I, I would prefer it if we kept them, if we made them the same. I, I, I'm aligning with you guys. Just wanna make sure we're not missing something. Okay, I don't see any other hands up. Any other points on this before I ask a very painful question? Okay. I want to do it, Doug. I want to do it. I, you answered my question. Thank you, Scott. Are you serious? Heck yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Let's see if I can get back to the issue. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Unless someone wants to fight me for it. I doubt that. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Okay, um, hold on. Oops. Jeez, I can't type. Okay. Um, yeah, these were there mainly because they were there last week. Um, the only reason I kind of kept this one on, whether Epoch should be global or not, is because of the conversation you and I had, Scott, during the last week's call, where we were talking about this, and I was, and we got into the 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 discussion point about how uh, 
if we made this change, it's going to really, really make it hard when you start syncing up between discovery endpoints. And we then kind of landed, I think, in a position of, well, maybe we shouldn't talk about that and leave that as either exercise for later or it's someone else's problem. But our initial job should be to focus on how to make a single individual discovery endpoint work well. Okay. And so what I wanted to do was to bring back up this issue to say two things. One is, is that where everybody's head, everybody else's head is at? And that for now we should focus on just a single discovery endpoint. And if so, what do people think about this issue uh, within that scope? And just to refresh everybody's memory, this issue is talking about how today in the spec, the epoch value is basically localized to each individual service. There's no correlation whatsoever between epoch values across services. This is proposing to make that, to, to, to change that, to make it so that every single time a new epoch value needs to get assigned to a service, it's globally incremented or it's, it's globally made a, lar a larger value. What that, what that enables is for us to query the system and say, give me all services that have been updated since a particular epoch value. Okay, and in order to do that, you have to have something that spans all services. Okay, so I guess the question for the group that I have is two things. One is, are we okay with fo right now focusing just on single discovery endpoint, making that as good as possible? And two, what do people think about this feature? Is it worth it? Anybody want to comment? You're, I think you're asking for a, a, an atomic incrementer. Yes. And I don't think we can do this. Like, I don't think you can mandate this. That, that, that is kind of what I'm asking, yes. But, you, but if you think about it, you, you almost have to do the exact same thing anyway on a per service level, don't you? Yes, on a per service level you do. Um, but only for the, produce, the services that you produce. That's the key difference. Elaborate on what you mean by produce. So if you, you are in charge of reporting uh, X, Y, and Z services, those are yours, but you also accept an aggregation from some of the other downstreams or upstreams. You don't control those epochs. You control only X, Y, and Z. It's interesting you say it that way because the spec doesn't make a distinction between who owns a service. It's the discovery endpoint just has a list of services and my assumption has always been, uh, I may get a put request for any of the services in there. And then the discovery endpoint increments the epoch for whatever service you targeted. We have no notion of ownership is what I'm trying to say. Is that something we need to add? Or roll back the, the put until we actually need it. Interesting. Clemens, you came off mute. Did you want to say something? Uh, no, it was intentional, sorry. <laughs> Darn, okay. Um, if we roll back the put, how do we standardize uploading? I, I don't think you do. I think it's a poll model only. But even a... Uh, but then I think we, we need to go through the, the interop event to actually see if these are problems or not. Okay, because, okay. I mean, we, could, I don't, we don't have to resolve this today. We, we definitely can wait. Um, I, I, I am kind of confused though by your statement of a poll model only. So even, even bootstrapping a discovery endpoint should not be done via something like a put to you? No, I think you do it out of band from the API. It's right, it's like, it's, it'd be like the zookeeper config that you're in charge of these downstreams or upstreams, right? I always get the up and down streams <laughs> part wrong. Hmm. I like that we don't have to define the API for the mechanics of all of how this works. It could be up to the implementer's discretion here. That is true. We, like we maybe could... their root. Sorry, go ahead. Maybe their bootstrapping process is you know pulling from some central config or a database or uh, some other like service discovery endpoint or an API endpoint. So in the, but, it, but you did mention earlier that the case of a discovery endpoint being sort of some sort of aggregator. Um, 
And to me, whether that's a push or a pull model to get the information into the aggregator, um, it does it not seem still useful for somebody who's querying that discovery endpoint to say, has anything changed since a particular time? Uh, to me, the, the discovery endpoints that push data to, to downstreams, to their downstreams, kind of breaks the eventing model because now the, the discovery endpoints understand the, the topology of this wacky system instead of each node knowing where it wants to pull data from. No, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I wasn't thinking about the what's changed from a syncing of discovery endpoint perspective. I was actually thinking more about from a client perspective, right? I have a I have a an application that presents some services to a user so they can maybe choose one, right? And but periodically I need to query the discovery endpoint that I've hooked up to to know whether I need to update my UI, right, with a new list or so or you know call the list down because things vanished it would seem valuable to me as the author of that UI to be able to query the backend system, meaning the discovery endpoint, to say what's changed since the last time I talked to you. Yes, you could do that. But I don't think that the, I think that's a different value than this epoch. There's, that's probably a, a single other epoch value for the, the shape of your catalog. And, and then that could be global for that service, but it's just journaled entries that come from other places. Okay, and so if we had a if we had that other epoch value, you're saying then it would be an internal implementation choice to figure out how to map that global epoch value to uh, which services have been updated since some value of that global epoch value. Yeah, some somebody else chime in here, but I, I think we do this. We could do this with the the cache key that uh, is is a header a standard header for like CDNs. Interesting. Anybody else have an opinion on this? Does anybody else see value in being able to say what's changed since a particular point in time? I do. I just don't think it should be the, the that epoch value we're talking about for the service property. Okay, fair enough. Okay, yeah. uh, Simon, your hands up. Yeah, I agree with Scott. So um, uh, I'm also at a similar problem implementing discovery, and we decided to go with the cache, con uh, basically an e-tag um, as a solution for finding out if content changed uh, and versioning. Uh, if you need to have the really the details on it, but we we weren't considering having epochs and logical clocks for this because eventual consistency would be okay for uh, basically getting a synchronized state. Okay. All right, I'll tell you what, that, that, that helps. So thanks for the discussion, uh, Scott and Simon. Um, let me go back and rework this because um, you made some good arguments there, Scott. And I think, you've, I think you convinced me that yeah, a separate value would be probably uh, better and easier to implement and maybe even safer. So okay, let me go back and rework that. So thank you. Anybody else have any comments on this before we move away? Okay. Um, the only other thing on the list I thought might be interesting was this one, because I don't know whether, I don't remember where we landed on this one. Does anybody remember what, what if anything we want to do with this one? Here, here's the, the original thing. Because I had this vague recollection that we may have said it's out of scope for us. Um, I can help you refresh that, yeah. Okay, yeah, please. Yeah, that, that's correct. So we thought that it's probably not the best fit right now. And we would we basically said that we'll revisit this concept in future, but not, not for now, for sure. Okay. Would you be willing to add a comment to the issue stating that? Yeah, sure, I could. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, Scott, your hands up. I thought we also said that uh, it, we would consider it as an extension, like an official extension. Yeah, yep, I agree to that as well. Uh, okay. But but I think we need to address the concept of extensions in general before we uh, think or we classify anything as extension, right? So that entire topic is open right now. Or okay. is it not? I don't know. Well, when you say, do, can you elaborate a little on what you mean by um, deal with okay. extensions? 
so the extension fields, we, we still have to discuss on how do we want to handle the concept of extension fields within the specification right now? Or do we already know that? We, we already do. Okay, uh, this is something that I was not aware of. Yeah, could basically extensions appear as top level attributes. Oh, okay, cool. Then. And, and they have their own specifications. Oh. Yes, that is true too. Hold on, let me refresh everybody's memory. Ba -da -ba -ba. Extensions. Well, yep. those are the extensions that we have. Yep. There's an extensions section in the main spec. Yes. Uh, yeah. The extensions you... in the main spec is the mechanism that we use to allow those, like, well, those extensions are the official sanctioned ones by the cloud events providers. And the intention is that those are interoperable. You can also add your own, but make no accept, uh, expectation that anyone's going to understand them. That's right. Gotcha. But, but but just so specifically on this one, sorry, I was wasn't paying attention for two minutes. Um, the the webhook spec is effectively mandating the same. It is building on the same mechanism that HTTP itself builds on, um, which is the authorization header, and is not trying to invent anything new. Um, so so the authorization header is defined in what seventy two thirty. Four or thirty-five, um, and that's the exact mechanism that we're that we're building on. And then what the spec says, what the spec says is that it's assuming some uh, some token-based scheme, even OAuth two, which is you know the most widely uh, used uh, framework that we all use for for web for web authorization, um, makes makes no from has no firm mandate for using jots or not um, but it leaves it open which of the, which format the token ha has because the token is really a an agreement between the issuer of the token and the consumer of the token none of the parties which are sitting in the middle should care about the token because the token is really opaque um, it doesn't matter whether it's a jot or not So if you look at OAuth two, OAuth two will will have has extensions that tell you that it's a, it's a JWT, but it doesn't ultimately for the relationship between the issuer of the token and the consumer of the token, um, the 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 party that's actually putting the token into the uh, into the message doesn't need to know what format that token has. Help me out here, Clemens. Are you suggesting that we don't need to make a change? And I, I, I think I think the the spec as it stands is is um, uh, we're not we're not um, inventing anything beyond um, what HTTP prescribes, and I don't think we should we should invent anything beyond what HTTP prescribes. It's thirty two, it's thirty two seventy two thirty five RFC. So you're suggesting that we don't even need an extension? No, because because that's the webhook spec is an extension of our HTTP binding, and really defines how you deliver a an, a cloud event via post to a particular endpoint. So it basically is a is a constraint on the HTTP binding. HTTP binding allows you to bind a cloud event to any HTTP message, whether that's a request or a response and, and, and doesn't care about which the, what the, the method is. For, for webhooks, we need to have something that's a bit more specific um, for delivering events out in a push fashion. The webhook spec is kind of um, um, sitting on top of that. So the, it, it spec, that spec gets is specific about using post and also referring to um, a security mechanism, but it's referring to the security mechanism that is defined in um, uh, RFC 7235 and then also points to OAuth 2 um, as, the, as the framework around it. But I don't think we need to have anything special because that, that, that authorization header is not expressed in the cloud event. It's, it's out of band. Okay. Uh, Scott, your hands up. 
I, I think the, the thing that I'm considering is um, it would be nice to have this, you know, go through some other queue of some other protocol and then land still uh, with a proof of origin to some uh, target webhook. So how do we make this lossless through uh, protocol transformations? Oh, so you're 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 asking for something else. You're asking for a um, for a signature for the cloud event, right? Like the same concept, and it, it gets projected into HTTP as the standard mechanism, but it, it also can become part of the conical form of the cloud event, so that we can so, uh, so convert have, it to something else. So we've we have discussed this. Um, so we generally have, have discussed the, the problem of, of both encryption and signature for cloud events. And uh, several of us here have been around for a while and have seen the ship of SOAP sink uh, over uh, W security um, and the brutal complexity that it has. And so we have decided to scope out um, uh, in basically message level security both signature and encryption from cloud events 1.0. That was a very conscious uh, um, um, decision um, because we exactly W star evolved into C star because <laughs> it, it it turns out that um, uh, you know so probably wasn't a terrible idea until uh, all the security stuff came around where. People then started building, you know, TLS um, on top of of W star, and all it was terrible. It was not the XML Scott. So we've we've decided to punt on this. The but you're you're already kind of hinting at something that is um, probably a good path, and that is S mine, where I can I can see that we're that we would create something that allows um, uh, cloud events to be encoded with SMIME and that, that SMIME packets can then be routed. So that's, that's ultimately, I think, where that might land. But we have, we have decided not to tackle that problem. OK, uh, Manuel, your hands up. Yeah, I think the, we pretty much summarized where we got to uh, last week. But uh, I just wanted to raise that this was about uh, really the signature, or it has evolved into this. Uh, originally, it was based really on the authorization um, header, but I think the use case would have been to um, authenticate with somebody further down the line. So if you communicate through a webhook with an event gateway and that is that event is propagated to uh, a consumer, then the consumer has no means to uh, check whether the message, the event, the, the content had been messed with. So this is, I think, where it came from. Um, and uh, I don't think that the authorization header here helps. As mime, yes, sig message signature, maybe also. But if I'm, would that work across all uh, transports of cloud events? Um, if we so, if we decided that we wanted to create an SMIME um, binding for um, for cloud events, and if we then uh, made effectively a a binary pass through of the cloud event um, through the infrastructure, I can see that working. Um, but it's something that we have to go and spec out. So I'm, I'm so as as things stand right now, the the cloud event would probably not translate. Okay, uh, Anish, your hands up. Um, I, I don't know. It's probably kicking my OCDs into action, but uh, somehow it just does feel wrong to have something as sensitive as authorization part of the standard spec. I mean, even as an extension. Yeah, I don't know. It might be just me, though. <laughs> but that's that was the point. That was the point. It's like that I, we're referring to it. Mm -hmm. um, we're referring to RFC seventy two thirty five effectively, and say that's HTTP's problem. Mm -hmm. And then we're referring to OAuth and saying and saying, yep, how you acquire a token? Go go look go, go look here. We don't want to go and define anything related to 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 security here, but we want to go and effectively just refer to existing mechanisms. And then on the point of, of 
authenticating a against against a downstream um, um, uh, entity. I hear that a lot. Um, like amongst plumbers, I have to say, I don't, I never hear this of customers, but I, I hear this a lot from amongst plumbers as a, as a alleged scenario that needs to be supported. I'm not sure it's real because most of the messaging systems that I'm, that I'm seeing are um, effectively surrounded by gatekeepers. And if you're allowed to put a message into um, the system, then, and, and the system supports routing, then the system will effectively, um, um, you know, route the message to whatever the destination is. And having having a system which kind of routes you four hops, and then the message kind of stops at one at one gate where it says, oh, the message can't pass here." It, I agree that that's a theoretical scenario. I'm just missing the the real scenario for it. Yeah, but but I do also see the point what Scott brought in. Like for example, what if you really want to propagate fields like this down the protocols? Like this is a very HTTP specific thing. But what if it's some AMQP client? Is, is you know it needs this particular value? So do we really need to think into that direction? That how do we propagate such sensitive fields across protocol? Is it is it really part of you our business? You, you, what you can't what you can't do is you can't give an intermediary the keys to the castle to a downstream uh, entity because nothing, nothing prevents that intermediary for, from, then, from then reusing your credentials. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out what's the next steps here. I mean, nothing or guidance or what? I think Clemens, you're suggesting nothing and close the issue, right? Um, yeah, I believe this is solved. Well, Clemens, how do you deal with, uh, so you, you have these guards and the pipes and stuff, but if you use cloud events to act as a router and you don't use the gatekeeped queues anymore, and there's a bunch of mixed messages on a single pipe, uh, you don't, you, you lose the ability to gatekeep. What do you mean? Right, like, so, Maybe there's a particular consumer that would like to verify that uh, only the bank database sent you data. But well, it, it, it can it can always do that. So it it's not clear to me that we, that that's a problem that we need to solve as a in the general case. So if you want to do this, since cloud events carries the data is always binary, or or can always be binary. Nothing stops you from from, put, from making the event data such that it's S mime signed. So if you have the particular case that you really want to make sure that you have um, that the data is uh, can be authenticated, then nothing stops you from crafting the payload of the event such that you can go and verify it on the other side. Okay, I think that's what the advice should be. Then is we say. Uh, the cloud event envelope is not going to support this directly, but uh, the guidance is stick it in the data payload. Yeah, I, I, because I think that's a, the reason why we the, the reason why we create the, the cloud events um, um, metadata or where we have it is that because we want to make it possible for for arbitrary well not arbitrary but cloud events supporting um, infrastructure using arbitrary protocols the ones that we support to have a shared understanding of what to do with those events and how to dispatch them. But it's, so it's, it's more a, a, a spec that is helping you to help foster interoperability than you know, having the, the originator of the event, the producer of the event, and the consumer of the event um, deal with their end-to-end with their -end relationship. Because the end-to-end -end relationship is ultimately about what, what's in that event in terms of payload. And they can do whatever they want. One of, the, one of the principles that you'll find in most messaging systems is that end-to-end -end security is generally only happening at the endpoints with the broker having no business in, in, in dealing with it at all. It's end-to-end -end security is often something that's, that's only being done by the clients, but the only server piece may be some shared key store, but that's it. So I would, I would follow the same principle here and say, you know, if you really want to have end-to-end -end security, including validation of who sent that event, 
that's something that should be handled end to end, which means it's, it's handled based on the payload. Okay, so we're almost out of time. Um, I apologize, Anish, it was you that was suggesting you may be able to respond, right? Yeah, yeah I can do that. Okay, do, do you feel like you understand which way to respond? Because I, I kind of got the sense that maybe there's a PR in here someplace to add additional guidance someplace, maybe in the primer, mm -hmm. or maybe one of our specs, I don't know. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like you have a, place. I'm sorry, go ahead, Clemens. The, the, I think the primer is a good place for it. Okay, Anish, do you have a good sense of where the group might be wanting to go with this, that you could take the next steps with it? Yeah, I can raise a PR or the primer MD. Sure. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So with that, uh -oh, where's my cursor? There it is. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So Anish will do that. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, okay. That was, I think that's it for the agenda. I don't think we have time to really discuss anything else. Um, one last person, last, last thing, Erica, I have you. Uh, Michael, are you still on the call? I am, yes. Excellent, okay. Is there anybody else on, that I did not get for the attendee list? Okay, in the meantime, uh, does anybody have any topics for the SDK subgroup? Because I believe that the spec or the agenda is still empty. So I'm suggesting that we cancel the SDK call immediately following this one. Is there any objection to that? Or does anybody have any topics? Okay. Anything else people want to bring up for today's call for the main call? Okay. In that case, I believe we are done. Thank you, everybody. We'll talk again next week. And just remember, there is no SDK call right after this. We just canceled it. All right. So talk again next week. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.